Well, welcome back to the Tin Talk podcast. This is episode six. I'm hosting. I'm Brian Barraza. I'm joined by Joan Hunter. Thank you so much for being here. Say, Thanks for hello, having everybody. me. Hello, <laughs> I guess first, Joan, I wanted to, to we, we just come from a workout, and so I wanted to slow things down and see, like, how you doing? What's up? Doing okay. It's been pretty busy with, you know, travel um, mm-hmm. and uh, just a lot of things, you know, going on, not just running related things. Yeah. Um, you know, we got a new little granddaughter and another one on the way and yeah. uh, just a lot of, you know, other things. Yeah, a lot, so, lot going on for lot the hunters. A lot going on. I, I'm kind of <laughs> used to that, but. Mm-hmm. Just, yeah. So I guess to kind of uh, dive into things, not many coaches have made the transition to, from high school to pro coaching. Uh, <laughs> how, how'd you do it so successfully? And like, what were some of the things that were more challenging that you were in, than you were anticipating? And what were some of the things that went more smoothly than you were anticipating? Um, well, first, thanks for saying that I've done it successfully. I, I think so. I, I mean, I still feel like I have a lot, lot to learn and mm-hmm. I'm trying to get better mm-hmm. at what I'm doing. Um, I, I kind of have to laugh at the idea of, you know, the transition from high school to, you know, pro or post-collegiate coaching because, you know, it's hard enough for high, high school coaches don't make the transition to college coaching. It's mm-hmm. super hard to get your foot in the door. Um, you know, most college coaches start out as grad assistants and they were former runners. Right. And so, you know, it's 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 really hard for a high school coach to, to bridge the gap and, um, uh, not very many people have done it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, as they say, unfortunately, sometimes it's not what, you know, that gets you the job. It's who, you know, Mm -hmm. that gets you the job. And obviously, um, I knew Drew Hunter and you guys needed a new coach. (laughs) So, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that that's certainly one reason why I'm here mm-hmm. um, and was considered uh, for the job. So, um, oh, you asked me a lot of questions all at one did, time. Yeah. That, that's really hard for me. Um, <laughs> I'm old. So, okay. Uh, what What do you think were some of the things that have allowed you to make the transition as smoothly as you have? Um, well, coaching is coaching. I mean, I don't... Um, uh, when I think about it, I and I've told a lot of people this, you know, coaching you guys is not really that different than coaching a bunch of high school kids. Yeah. In a lot of ways, you're 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 older, you're faster, you do the little things better. Most of you, not, not everybody. <laughs> I will admit that some little things I think my high schoolers did better yeah. as a team. Mm-hmm. Um, but we've been working on that. Right. And. Um, uh, so it's really just not that different. I, I also think that in some ways I had an advantage and I would give this shout out to most good high school coaches. I think you develop skills as a high school coach um, that you might not have the chance to develop if you go right into coaching mm good college runners uh, as your first coaching job you know I have to work had to work with people of lower talent levels and for me to get the most out of them um, you know to help them develop their athletic selves I had to do things and a little differently and learn you know how to do things to develop talent that isn't quite as at mm-hmm. the same level so it gives you maybe a few more tools in your toolbox right. uh, in in your coaching toolbox yeah. to um, have thought through some of those you know how do we develop this athlete who can't do this and has to do this mm-hmm. or whatever working within the limitations of each athlete exactly yeah. and so um um you know i think that was maybe something that i brought to the table that was good especially since you guys were all injured most like half the team was injured mm-hmm. when i took over so when you took over the team was kind of in shambles in terms of injuries and now we're at this at this place where most of us are running rather healthy like how did we get there um well the team was in shambles as far as injury goes but in a lot of other ways that right. were i think we'll get even, there <laughs> yeah probably more devastating than the injuries mm-hmm. <laughs> um so uh, with the injuries, I mean, uh, we just um, had to uh, do. I, I wasn't here full time, so I'm trying to remember how we how we did all this. Um, 
we started, you know, we expanded how people were able to get their physical therapy. Like, mm-hmm. I think we, we moved from just having, you know, massage to enabling people to have other um, professionals working with them. You know, we implemented some cross training. We had to just really kind of dumb things down mm-hmm. until people were, were healthy. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to change and we have changed though I still think we could do better is I just felt like there wasn't enough um, prep for training going on there was Mm. too much walking straight out the door and running and just not enough taking care of the little details with our bodies especially when we are injury prone Mm. (laughs) so that's one of those ways that the the high school athletes had a had a little bit better discipline than we did well yeah and and they didn't question it like when you anytime you try to implement something new there's always pushback Mm -hmm. and I didn't think when I came in to take over the, the situation that it would have been a smart thing for me to try and change everything at mm-hmm. one time. I, that would have not been good. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, so I didn't, didn't want to do that, but you know, with, with my high school team, they didn't know any different right. once we had been there for mm-hmm. a while, you know, the, this is just how we do things. Yes. We have a dynamic warm up. Yes. It takes 30 to 35 minutes every single day of your life before mm-hmm. you go running. And it was just accepted. Yeah. And I didn't feel like that was, um, really popular thing here when I first came (laughs) in. Well, what I think is really interesting is the place where I go with this is I start to think about habits, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, initially, when you came in, we had these habits that were geared towards not um, activating as best as we could. And and it was very much just like, okay, get up and go run, right? Mm -hmm. But now you've kind of created this culture where the expectation is, okay, you're going to activate before you run. You're going to do all of the drills and things that you've gotten from your massage therapist, from your PT and everything that's, that's geared towards making you like in the best possible position before you start the run, Right. right? And the place where I start thinking about that is like, when that's just the expectation, it doesn't feel like, oh, okay, this is a thing I have to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so this starts becoming a a situation where now we're talking about culture, right? And I think that team culture is something that we've, you know, we've kind of gone back and forth on you and I, because we, we, we like talking about this kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on like, the role of a coach in determining the culture of a team versus the letting things kind of grow more organically. Mm. I mean, I think that culture does start with the athletes, but it can be led and shaped mm. by the coach. Um, you know, we, we dealt with this obviously when we were coaching at the high school level and with a huge team, you don't always have a grasp on the entire team mm. culture. You, you know, there's little pockets within your team that, you know, may not be so positive mm-hmm. and others that are doing, you know, everything the way you believe they are mm-hmm. and they're, they're genuine. They're, they're right. truly, um, they're not faking mm-hmm. a positive team culture. Right. And, um, you know, i I feel like I'm a really relational coach, so I like to know my athletes as, as people. And mm-hmm. I think in that way, that's how I would tend to, to shape team culture, to encourage the things that I want to see, but I, I need to know who I'm dealing with right. before I know, you know, who needs this kind of mm. encouragement or this kind of kick in the butt, you know, <laughs> right. I, you just, or, you know, or pointing out this is not helping mm-hmm. our, our team, right. you know, your selfishness is not helping our team or your, um, you know, let's let's think about how your actions impact others on mm-hmm. the team. I think, you know, sometimes we all need those kinds of reminders. Oh, for sure. So, yeah, that was, that was one of the things that I was really grateful for in, in the, the work that I did with, with my college coach, Steve Magnus, is mm-hmm. we like, he, we did these like small group meetings where right. we talk about these kinds of things. And yeah, I, I, I was that. all about those. Uh-huh. And I uh, bet some people hated those. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Well, it's a, it's a place where you're kind of almost forced into a space of vulnerability and there's, yeah. there's challenge there. But one of the things that, that he said that always stuck with me is that like literally everybody on the team is a leader. Mm-hmm. Everybody is leading in their direction. And this is, this has greatly impacted the way that I view team culture, right? It's like, 
you have everybody's individual values that that point in a certain direction whether it's like oh well i i just want to like be on the team so that i can say that i ran in the ncaa and right. and but i really love partying every weekend right like then your values are pulling you in a certain direction whereas like if you're actually about like I want to get everybody on this team to be on the same page and make sure that we're all pulling in the same direction that's that's leading towards some sort of conference championship, which was one of our goals at U of H, but ended up not panning out on the distance side of things. Like, where all of those individual values overlap, that Venn diagram, that is the actual team culture. Yeah. And so what I think is really interesting about the way that you're talking about being a relational coach is you're you're understanding the values that each individual has and you're kind of like tweaking a little bit here or encouraging a little bit here. And I'd be interested to hear your thoughts when it comes to like motivation via carrots versus sticks. I am not a huge motivation by stick person. Yeah, it's just neither. not my not, not my style. I don't I don't like to parent that way. Mm. I I don't you know, I think parenting is very similar to coaching. <laughs> I agree. Um not honestly. that I'm a parent. Yeah, I know, but <laughs> it really is. So, uh you know, you you're trying to make decisions for you know, other people mm-hmm. and lead them in the in the way that we all supposedly want to go. Mm -hmm. So, um, sometimes though you might not be on the same page. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've had to really learn and think more about leadership as Mm -hmm. I've taken over this team because I am such a relational coach. It's, it's probably easy to dismiss me sometimes as a leader. I think, um, because I don't have a real rah, rah style and I'm not going to, you know, get in your face and scream at you if you've done something that I don't like. It's just not who I am. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's been a major issue, but I think, you know, early on people probably wonder how much they can get away with. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I don't know. You you can answer how I'm doing with that probably. (laughs) I I think you're doing well. I mean, the way that I approach the coach athlete dynamic is like I seek to be as coachable as possible. Right. You know, because you like, are very coachable. I, I, I recognize that here is a person who's like they've got the thousand yard view, you know, and I'm in the trenches. And it's like if I'm if I'm over here like thinking that I should be turning left here, but you're you can see like, oh yeah, but you, you might think that that's the, the shorter way to go, but in reality, there's road closures and you're going to end up having to go all the way around and it's going to take you four times as long. You know, what you actually need to do is go right here. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, of course I'm going to trust you. You right. know, it's like that coach-athlete dynamic is such that you, like, I know that you have my best interests at heart and, like, the relationship isn't top-down. Mm-hmm. It's it's us as equals working together. Yeah, collaborating. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and that's that's true. Yeah. I just am more collaborative. I value what you think you need to be doing. Mm-hmm. I may not always agree with all of it and I will let you know mm-hmm. um and say how about this? You know, mm-hmm. this is why I think we should do this. But you know, you guys have been doing this stuff for a while and you have valuable insight mm-hmm. into things like your training right. or your race schedules mm-hmm. or um, you you know things that I don't actually know things that I'm still learning mm-hmm. um, that go along with this job yeah so but it, it's it's a two way street right because like I find that for myself I'm an athlete like I rely on my level headedness I rely on my conservative training <laughs> approach that that is focused on consistency rather than necessarily pushing too much right mm-hmm. and so to to be very open here it's like that's one of the things that i really struggle with right and one of the things that we're really working on is trying to get to a point where you know there's a little bit more fire it's a, it's a little okay to, to to send it today yeah you know exactly and so that's one of those things that i really appreciate with the thousand yard view is like you can see oh yeah you have plenty of time before the next workout that you're actually going to need to be ready for and we can take everything else a little bit more relaxed until then mm-hmm. so today mm-hmm. get after it right <laughs> Yeah, and I do feel like I've had to give you permission to do that sometimes yeah. in training, and 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 I'm going to continue to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, part of that. I mean, I tend to be conservative too, mm-hmm. as far as training goes. I think one of the you asked me earlier, you know, what went well and what maybe didn't go well when you took over. I, I think maybe I was a little hesitant to push mm. the team too hard. At, because of the injuries right. and just what I was observing, where they were, you know, fitness-wise and that sort of thing, 
And plus, you know, I was very comfortable with the kind of training you guys were doing. It's, you know, Tom was a huge mentor for mm -hmm. me as a, as a coach. And plus he coached me, you know, mm -hmm. 10 or 12 or 15 years ago or whatever for a season. So I was so comfortable with, um, his style of training. And I, again, I didn't want to come in and make huge changes mm -hmm. to, to what you were doing. Um, but you know, his, his training historically, it had always been pretty conservative, keep the ball rolling, right, that kind right. of thing. And, um, I, I feel like I'm getting to the point now where I'm, I'm pushing it a little bit more mm -hmm. and, um, you know, putting in harder workouts and, and, uh, letting you guys go to the well occasionally. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I just feel like we have to at least try that. And if we get through that and you get faster, um, then it was a good decision. If right. I injure somebody that way, well, maybe not. Mm -hmm. And But the only way I'm going to know that is if I try it. And, you know, we have to do something to try and, and uh, get those improvements we want. I mean, right. we've had a lot of improvement. I don't know if people recognize that, but mm -hmm. um, Mark was going over performances how much people have improved uh since i guess you know we came on board and you know there were like 19 prs yeah um we've yeah. had nine prs just this indoor season and counting prs like the same person can pr more than once right and you know we are getting better mm -hmm. um obviously we like to make some teams right. but you know improving your performances is a step in that direction mm -hmm. so yeah. So this actually, I think, is is an interesting conversation to have about the the slow improvement versus like trying to push a little bit more for a bigger improvement, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I've always approached the sport in like a slow moving of the goalpost, moving up the ceiling, moving up the floor, moving mm -hmm. up the ceiling, moving up the floor. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I think that you could see that over the course of my career, right? Like even even in in the past couple of years, like now I'm at the place where running. 825 is like that's kind of my floor i'm expecting that yeah, that's my that's floor that's the worst and, it's going to be and that the best that it can mm -hmm. be i'm i'm hoping for something closer to 810 you right. know and so that that kind of dynamic is is one that is has played out for me in the long term because of the the approach that i take that's geared towards consistency and it's geared towards being a little bit more conservative mm -hmm. that being said like i recognize that the sport is one that you don't have a ton of time in, right? Right. Like I, I have been very fortunate to be rather injury resistant. I've, I've been able to be in this sport for 20 years at this point. Mm -hmm. And I'm still at this place where that sense of urgency, I've just been able to put it off, you know, mm -hmm. like, and it, and it's, it's like, you see people like Austin, coming to the team and bringing that fire and that urgency of like, no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not thinking next year. Mm -hmm. I'm not thinking next Olympic cycle. I'm thinking right now. Mm -hmm. I want to be great right now. Right. And so there's kind of this dynamic there that, that I feel like puts, we're at two, almost two ends of the spectrum. You know, Sam is another great example. Like mm -hmm. Sam is out here. Like I want to make European championships. I want to make, I want to get medals. I want to make teams. Like that's the whole thing. And, yeah. and for me, I've always been a little bit more process oriented and, and a little bit more slow and methodical about the way that I do things. And like, I think it's an interesting dynamic between the two of those. And I'm, I'm curious what you think of like, how, how do you blend those? How do you mix those? Is one better than the other in your opinion? Like wh what are your thoughts and how do you frame this? Well, I think when I stepped into the team, um, everyone was so focused on their, you know, performance goals for that year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody was trying to hit the U S standard make so they could, you know, run in, in the trials and things. And it was detrimental. Mm -hmm. It was the only thing anybody cared about was how fast I've got to hit this time. I've got to hit this time. I've got to mm -hmm. hit this time. The shoes were a big controversy mm -hmm. every, you know, it was, uh, it was so stressful and it was such a failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it just being focused on if I, I'm a failure, if I don't hit this time and then nobody hits any times. And so we're all failures. And that to me spoke volumes about just being focused on those kinds of outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, this, I mean, there were so many other factors involved. It wasn't, it was just such a stressful time for everybody for the team but i think there was also this 
sort of panicked sense of we only have all these opportunities, these very few opportunities to get these this time standard and, and mm-hmm. do these things. And and it, it wasn't a good way to do things. And I got caught up in it just as well because mm-hmm. I knew how much it really mattered to everybody. Um, so I think I think really it makes much more sense to focus on the process of of getting to those goals and the way we get there is to improve and the way we improve is to work on our process right right? i mean it's just you you have to be able to do the training you have to stay healthy you can't um you know train for two months and then be have an injury setback for three weeks and train for two months and then get sick for three weeks Mm -hmm. and and so creating the most successful strategy to do that i think pushes us towards those goals, which are fine to have in the back of our mind. You know, Mm -hmm. we, you know, of course we want to run certain times and make teams and do things like that. But, um, focusing on what we are actually able to control, Mm. um, is a lot, um, healthier. Yeah, I would agree. I think that's one of the (laughs) big, the big things that has made an impact, uh, on my career from, from this coaching relationship is that, that sense of like, you see things is in the same way that I do with that mm-hmm. process orientation and you don't just let me rest on the process though. You also challenge me to like push today, you yeah. know, like don't, don't just do the bare minimum that's necessary to be able to come back tomorrow. Right. Like do what you can and then, and maybe push a little bit and then maybe, maybe tomorrow's recovery day is, is even easier right. than it should have been. Exactly. You know, or, or you take a day off. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, with you, yeah, I like what, what I'd like to see with you is you pushing yeah. physically more and, yeah. and find out what you really can get out of yourself mm-hmm. um, on occasion. Uh, having said that, I know that, you know, this fall you've had a lot of there's been a lot of personal stress in your life <laughs> and there's just been a lot of things that, you know, we didn't count the cost of necessarily. Right. And um in hindsight, it you know it took a, it took its toll. You mm-hmm. got a lot of really good training in, however, mm-hmm. and you took your you ran volumes of running that you've never really sustained before. Right. And so I'm holding on to the fact that good will come from that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, but I will always be probably prodding you to run harder and holding other people on the team back a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I felt like with Joey, when I started coaching, he was always running over his head ability wise. Mm. And I tried to rein him in and, and get him to run where, you know, okay, Joey, that, that is not your threshold effort. Mm. We're going to dial this down a little bit. Let's just dial it down a little bit. And after doing that, now it's like he's risen to another level and now yeah. he has absolutely no problem. <laughs> he's crushing. running with anybody yeah. on our team right now. And, um, I, but I think that dialing it back for a while and absorbing the amount of work he had put in that was maybe too hard mm-hmm. um, allowed him to to move up yeah. genuinely to that kind of training yeah. level. So, yeah, figuring all that out is it's a lot of trial and error. It honestly. is. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's one of the things that I think is really cool is is you've shown your coaching maturity to be able to to handle all of those things in stride. And and speaking of having to handle things in stride, we kind of touched on this or at least alluded to it earlier. You you took over in the middle of some rather rough circumstances with the team. Yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like for you? I know that you're like one of the qualities that I admire the most about you is you're, you're very empathetic. And so I know that this experience was something that was really challenging for you. Yeah, it was, um, it, it was, it was really, really hard. <laughs> um, looking back, I, I, I still feel like that whole spring and summer really were probably the most stressful mm-hmm. thing I've ever walked through. And just, um, uh, for for a lot of reasons, <laughs> for a lot of reasons, um, you know, having getting a phone call saying, you know, we want to make a change to in our coaching and and can you help us out? That was a big enough. That was kind of mm-hmm. shocking enough. Okay, um, to get to get that call and of course, you know. You know, being my son that called me, I, I want you always want to help your child. So right. I kind of thought, well, we'll, we'll all I can step in and, uh, um, 
you know, try and provide some structure and support from afar and, you know, write the training and, and um, hopefully get through this patch and make it, you know, to the, to the trials and everything will be okay. And, you know, I, it was probably pretty naive. It quickly escalated to from, you know, Drew wanting me to do that to the team wanting me to do that or most of the team, not all of the team. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it just was really hard. Uh, I, I'm, probably sound like I can't even think coherently about it but it was kind of just a, a whirlwind time and plus obviously I was living in Virginia I was still coaching my high school team mm -hmm. uh, Mark and I had already decided that we were not going to return to high school coaching the the next year mm -hmm. um, that's a whole different story but um, just navigating through COVID and trying to provide an activity for our athletes who needed something in their lives right. at that point, uh, it had just become kind of a, a really heavy burden and we needed to take a break. Hmm. Um, so then to kind of jump into this while I was still doing that, <laughs> that um, was, was hard. Yeah. Um, and I was trying to fly back and forth a little bit to go to some of the races that never went well. <laughs> And I just felt, I felt like an imposter and I felt very out of place mm -hmm. in those pro meets, um, just walking around going, wow, that's Jerry. Wow. Yeah. That's, you know, so-and-so. Wow. That's this athlete. <gasps> I don't even know where, you know, what the procedure is here at this I can meet. Relate. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just felt really, I hate being I hate being in the limelight. I hate, and I felt like I was in this fishbowl mm. and the, and, and probably, you know, you're always thinking, oh, other people are thinking about you more than they're right. really thinking about right. you. And maybe that was true. Probably at the meets that was true. But because of all the stuff that had gone on, all the online mm -hmm. criticism that I was fully aware of, um, it was, it, I just, it was not a comfortable place for right. me in any way. Yeah. How did you, how did you deal with that? Um, I just, I'm a fixer. You probably already know that. I like, when I say I'm going to help somebody do something, I'm not a quitter. Mm -hmm. And I, and I cared about you guys. I did, I was still trying to really get to know you all from afar and on my little short trips out here. And, and, um, I, I just wanted to make things better. I, I wanted, I knew it was so hard for everybody and um, just emotionally everything that was going on and just, we didn't, I don't think we counted the cost of the, of making a coaching change at the time that the coaching change was made mm -hmm. in the lead up to, you know, the trials and stuff. And, and I think I just felt like I was trying to put band-aids on a lot of different mm -hmm. things while um, trying to hope that maybe long term we'd come out the other side mm -hmm. and be able to actually move on and do good things right <laughs> and just survive this this season mm -hmm. so um yeah i mean i prayed a lot <laughs> <laughs> um i just kept trying to figure out what everybody's needs were and and try and step in i was i was grateful that Corey was here mm -hmm. at least you know boots on the ground right at practice and and um um, that helped. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Kind of, it seems like you kind of chopped it up from like this big, massive thing into like these smaller, okay, how do I take care of you? Yeah. How do I take care of you? How do I take care of you? Yeah. And, and then how to, you know, bring the team together. I mean, I, when people are that stressed, there's a lot of, you tension. know, tension between yeah. people. And, it was palpable and, for a while. I'm sure. And I wasn't really here for a lot of that. And, um, yeah, it was just a really hard. It was a it was a really big growing time in mm -hmm. my life, and it wasn't growth that I was actually looking for. Right. So. But it's growth that I'm sure you're still. I'm, I'm from, grateful you know? to it. Yeah. I mean, I for it because I I needed to get to the point where I really, you know, don't care what people say about me. I mean, of course, I still care. Right, right. I and I care when I hear things about my athletes. Um, you know, but I, I got to the point where I could hear it kind of say, okay, and then say, you know, I can't control what mm -hmm. people say or think, or, you know, I can just keep doing what I know to do mm -hmm. and do the best I can with that. And I probably needed that right. little life lesson. So, yeah. so I guess in the midst of all of that turmoil, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you were guided by a few core values that, that we've kind of 
you know, to greater and lesser extents, like we, we've touched on with everybody's individual values making up the team culture, right? Mm-hmm. But like, what are some of the values that guide you in and kind of like help, are your North Star for trying to, you know, steer this ship in the right direction? Um, well, I, I guess I lead, I look at my leadership role as a service role, really. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not just like this, you know, dictator. Right. I'm there to serve you as I'm leading. And I guess that would be how I look at, you know, my, my goals and my values. I mean, that's just the way I do things. Mm-hmm. Um, so <clears throat> I don't know what else were you asking? <laughs> no, that was it. it it's interesting. Cause I think I actually, I, I, I do kind of the same thing at yeah. least in, in recent days. I mean, I feel like, um, it's, one thing, one thing about running, or probably any, I'm sure any any pro sport or you know post collegiate person that's trying to get to that next level or whatever, it is a selfish endeavor. Mm-hmm. Okay, you have to be somewhat self centered to get it done. Um, to say I can't do that because I have to do this, mm-hmm. or I can't go to this with you because I have to be up at six in the morning yeah. to go to this whatever, and it, it it's self centered. But when we're just self centered, we're not really mm. good people yeah. and I feel like in a team we have to be other oriented yeah. to some extent and um, I guess that's really what I wanted to see on the team is is and maybe that's naive I don't know I don't know if other teams operate that way that's just I'm not really happy if I'm coaching a team that doesn't at least operate that way at some mm. level yeah. I you know of course you find out afterwards that your team that you think you know, I know this happened to us several years in high school coaching. You think everyone is is on the same page and they're uplifting their teammates and there's things going on behind your back that you never see. Mm. And you hear about five years later and you go, oh, how did I miss that? But, mm. you know, I, that, I, I don't want that. I want, you know, a cohesive mm-hmm. um, team where people care about each other and we, we boost each other to higher levels. Yeah. And, and one thing, you know, I've seen in the past is, you know, it, you can kind of tell if a culture's not good if somebody runs well and the teammates are, like, disgruntled about the fact mm. that their their teammate ran well. Mm-hmm. They feel threatened by it. That's not a good right. sign. Where's the psychological safety in that? Yeah. If, <laughs> oof, no, you don't like that. So we should be happy. If one person is, is doing well and you're, you're doing appropriately similar training... Mm-hmm. Then you know you can be, be encouraged well too. Yeah. by that. Be encouraged. Be happy yeah. for that person. That should be a source of confidence for you. Exactly. Yeah. So I think you know we've actually had to kind of talk about that a little bit. But um, one of the you know obviously we've been talking a little bit about like the past, right? And I mm-hmm. want to kind of shift gears a little bit now and and kind of ask about the the future of mm-hmm. TME and uh, like what are some of the challenges that we're facing in terms of trying to get recruits, Mm -hmm. not only on the men's side of things, but on the women's side of things? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, I would say to be perfectly transparent, our biggest issue is funding. Mm -hmm. Um, We uh, uh, need to be able to provide some level of support for Mm -hmm. athletes who are coming out. And if, um, you know, if Adidas isn't offering a whole lot of contracts, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're, we have to find another way to fund athletes, right. you know, just like, uh, you know, everybody on our team that doesn't have an individual contract with Adidas, you know, has to e- either they're, f- they're finding their own funding. Um, mm-hmm. they're working either for the team or outside of the team or coaching, coaching or, yeah. or you know, through hammer and ax or whatever. Um, but, uh, funding is, is just a huge, huge issue mm-hmm. um, for, for building our team. So um, we need to find creative ways to raise more funding. Right. We, we could, so anybody watching this, <laughs> I'll just throw it out there. Um, you know, <laughs> shameless plug. Shameless right. plug for sponsor sponsorships and, and or donors, you know, I yeah. mean, that want to invest in a up and coming athlete who's, Mm-hmm. you know, got all their sites set on 2024. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's, that is truly, I think the biggest issue. I think another issue is, okay, so they brought in this new coach and she's a high school coach and she's Drew's mom. And do I really want to be involved in that? <laughs> mm. I mean, that, I think clearly that could well, be an issue. I think, I think regardless of your relation to Drew, I think it's just 
anytime that there's a new coach in at the helm, like there's a bit of a gamble. That was that was Heck one of the yeah. gambles that I that I took whenever I went to U of H. Is mm-hmm. like Steve was a, a brand new college right. coach, you know, and I was like, yeah, that's fine, yeah. you know. But like I also operated with a certain level of naivete in high school that right. that ended up being great for me. But <laughs> but it is something that is a little challenging when people are trying to get a. A professional career started sure um, I don't blame them a bit right but what, I, what I'm also curious about is like specifically on the women's side of things like what what are some of the challenges that we face trying to build out a women's team when we don't have an established group already well I, there, I think there's a few things and they're they're tied really also to why we aren't building a men you know adding a bunch of men I again a lot of it is funding right um, so uh, that needs to be in place I mean we were uh, actively recruiting more than several women this this past year. Mm-hmm. Um, but what really ended up happening is um, Adidas didn't sign any of those athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't, um, we, we kept ha- waiting, but we didn't know when, if they were. It right. was a long, long process until people actually, w- until we found out, no, there are not going to be any others mm-hmm. coming out. Um, so, a lot, several of the women ended up going other places uh, that we were recruiting. Some mm-hmm. got shoe contracts. A few got shoe contracts or with e- or either shoe contract or team contracts mm-hmm. where they had support and went to other teams. Right. Um, um, we did have a couple of athletes that were interested in joining as like a tier three, which would be no funding from us. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but they weren't really... Uh, the same events group as like Tori. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it just ended up that we got absolutely nobody, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, also when you only have one woman on the team, that's a, a little bit of a scary situation for other women to come into, you know, you have, you're putting kind of all your eggs in one basket with one training, one person to train mm-hmm. with, um, unless we could have gotten multiple women, which we would have, <coughs> liked to have done. we were hoping to bring in two or three mm-hmm. and it would have been great. So I know um, Tori's been a real trooper about, you know, making it work a lot on her own. Right. Um, and uh, it's hard. You know, she kind of, you know, we brought her in uh, after Corey. I mean, she moved out here to be coached right. by Corey. And then when Corey left, you know, <clears throat> she, she hadn't even been out here very long and was sort of uh, in, a, in a hard spot, you know. Yeah. But um, but she's she's really coachable and I enjoy working with her and she's also getting better. I think that's mm-hmm. you know that's another factor. If I were an athlete looking at a team, I would want to see that the, those athletes Progress. are happy and getting better. <laughs> <laughs> and we are we are getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, um, Tor, Tori really struggled for a long time and was not um, you know improving. And but this indoor season, I feel like. You know, she's really turned it around, ran yeah. two consecutive indoor PRs in, in an off distance. And, you know, she's going to take that into the outdoor season mm-hmm. and um, build from it. Yeah. So I think, you know, those are the main main issues. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's also interesting to consider the way that Tin Men Elite is structured. You know, obviously we started pretty grassroots. Mm-hmm. We've, we've had like this incredible focus on the community for such a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, so it adds an interesting dynamic when it comes to incorporating title sponsors as well. Mm. Um, but I think that that community piece, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about how I view myself in the same way that you view yourself in, in the coaching role as an athlete, right? Like to me, it's a service, a service orientation. Like I want to serve my teammates, but more than that, like I draw a lot of purpose and a lot of meaning from serving the running yeah. community as a whole. I would... <clears throat> And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on like why is it so important for Tin Man Elite as like a team and as like a, a culture to serve the running community rather than just you know like doing what other high performance focused teams do and kind of like hide behind an iron curtain and every once in a while come out to be like hey yeah we'll do yeah. something with the community. <laughs> it's like this is really like the bones of Tin Man Elite. Yeah. And, like so I'm I'm curious to hear how that how that fits in for you. I mean it fits in. Perfectly. It kind of goes back to my thought that, you know, running is such a selfish pursuit Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. you know, it's very easy to become very, very self-focused and not really give back or think about others. And, you know, when we do those community things, I mean, 
you guys see how much happiness oh, it brings to the beautiful. people that come. And, you know, even looking at it from a selfish point of view, that has to make you guys feel good mm. um, about being out there and just bringing so much happiness to some kid who just took a selfie with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to see that. I think it's important. I think because uh, our team started with guys trying to kind of make it on their own and um, they feel like real people to a lot of the, mm -hmm. the wider running community right. as opposed to maybe some of the more uh, reclusive pro athletes right. that, you know, are, like you say, in groups that don't really have a focus on that sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, or just their personalities are that way. I think it's kind of good to force uh, some of our guys who might not want to go that way naturally to just get out there. Because mm -hmm. I know that every time we've done a, a public event, you know, uh, our community runs last summer, the things we do at races, um, I'm sure there's a million things I'm not thinking of, but just showing up at, at meets and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, everyone feels good when they're done. You right. know, they know they made somebody's day. Yeah. And I like that. Well, it's interesting because, like, when I first joined the team, that was one of those things that really, like, cranked up the dial on my imposter syndrome. Because oh. it was like, you know who I am? Yeah. Like, why do you care about me? Like, I'm yeah. just some guy. <laughs> like, yeah. what is going on here? Isn't it funny? Yeah, but, like, as I've grown more comfortable in my identity and as as I've grown more comfortable as a member of this team and, and as, like, a, a person in, in the running community, like, I've really grown to like have my own personal mission in the sport where it's like I want to break down those perceived barriers right. that like just be you, know. you. yeah well it's yeah. like you know when I first joined like came on to the pro circuit like I, I had the same kind of reaction that you did when you went to meets and it was mm -hmm. like oh my goodness like that's that's Evan like mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> no <laughs> like and then, but like at the same time it was a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. I had that like the, the, the pedestal that I had those athletes on just kept getting higher. But at the same time, it started chipping it away a little bit because it's like, oh, he's just doing leg it's swings. It's normal. You know, it's like, I normal also person. do leg swings. That's great, you know? And so it's like, it kind of it kind of shifted me into this head state that was like, it's all the same. Yeah. And the, you know, and and there's this, generally when you're focused on high performance, you it's, it's easy to slip into this like, elitist mentality where it's like oh yeah like especially when people are taking shots at you on, mm -hmm. online where it's like yeah well what did you run and yeah. it's like well, yeah. what does it matter you yeah. know like everybody is out here doing the same thing and like there's a great story a good coaching story about uh percy Coretti, mm -hmm. who he's he's i think it was herb elliott was his athlete mm -hmm. and, and he was running the 1500 in the olympics and percy like the morning of the olympics takes him to the track and percy runs his coach he's like you know 70 years old or something like that mm -hmm. and he goes and he and he rips a 1500 and it's, it's pretty slow but he hammers it and he collapses across the line <laughs> and he turns to his athlete and he says you may run faster than me but you'll never run harder yeah. and that's the kind of that's the spirit of the yeah. running community like incarnate right there and I, I love that and it's one of those things that every time that we do a community event that's what just like makes makes me sing you know yeah. it's like everybody out here is in their own running journey and it's like you the, the sport has this this bittersweet dynamic to it where you can very easily compare to mm -hmm. somebody else because all tracks are 400 meters, right. you know, and, and every 5k is 5k objective. long. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's really easy to put yourself into that position and be like, Oh, well, okay. Well, they, they, wow. They've run my mile PR for a 5k split, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. that's insane. Right. But it's like at the end of the day, like I look back at my own running journey and I see, yeah, now I run reps at what used to be my mile PR. Yeah. But like, at the time when I ran that mile PR, that was the most I could ever do. And it hurts just as bad to run that 444 my freshman year of high school as it does to run 358 yeah. now. You right. know, it's just it's just a matter of, of yeah. like slowly moving the goalposts. It's, it's, it's like Reed now runs a marathon at the same at his PR 5K pace yeah. from like high school, I yeah. think. It's, it's insane. Crazy. Yeah. But so. that's that's one of the beautiful things that I think and, and that's why I think that, you know, that's kind of sets 10 men elite in a, in a slightly different place is like we have that structure and that focus on the community in such a way that it, it really does serve to, to break down those barriers. And we, we engage with people as people yeah. and not as like, I am runner number four on right. fast team trademark, <laughs> you know, like right. we, we actually, we, we conduct ourselves in such a way that the authenticity is what it, 
is center stage. And that's one of the things that I'm really trying to embody as I move forward in my, my running career and, and really, you know, hold space for every single person I interact with to be as authentic as possible because running is really hard. Yeah. And, and just being there for those people and encouraging mm-hmm. them and whatever they're doing is, is so meaningful to them. Right. So, and, and it's, it's reciprocity, you know, the support that they give to us is the support that we give yeah. back to them. I've, no, it's, it's great. Being in the sport for 20 years, I've taken a lot and it's nice to give back. Yeah. Yeah. So I really, you know, and I, I have a real fondness too for high school kids. Mm-hmm. And obviously I've coached high school for such a long time. So I really love it when we go to events and, you know, the high schoolers will come up and want pictures with you or yeah. me or and then just talk to them, you know, yeah. about, about what they're doing yeah. and um, just, their life. just makes me happy. Yeah. It's incredible. <laughs> so, well, Joan, thank you so much for coming onto the tin, tin talk podcast episode number six. Um, <laughs> It was, it was great to have you. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to do this again sometime soon. Um, for everybody that joined us, thank you so much. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, do the whole thing. Um, we'll see you next time.